Welcome back to Presidents in Politics. I am one of your hosts, Professor Kayla McGee, joined with my fellow host, Good morning. Uh, former Congressman Ross, also now Professor uh, Ross. And we are going to talk to you today about another one of the forgotten presidents. Yes, Zachary uh, Taylor. But probably one of the most interesting, I would say. I think a fascinating guy who was self-made, Yes. who, who had great hopes for himself. Salt of the earth. And yes, and <laughs> thought that he would never amount to anything but a true, you know, four decades as a, as a military officer. And in four different conflicts, he yes. fights in the War of 1812, he fights in the Second uh, Seminole Indian Wars, he fights in the Black Hawk War, which we always forget about, it's the Forgotten War, right. and then he fights in the Mexican-American War. So to put that in modern-day context, this would be like a, a, a modern-day military officer who had fought in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf, and he's yep. fought in four major conflicts. And he, he enlists at the age of 24. He, yes. is, he is a... Uh, he comes from a fairly well-to-do family, but 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 self-educated. He didn't mm-hmm. have any formal education. He was more of an outdoorsman, very much so, and 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 good with a musket, and and could could survive just about anywhere. And, and an amazing military mind, amazing military mind. In fact, so much so that he knew that the, fu- that the reason to fight was not just to fight, but the reason to fight was to get things better. When, yes, when he was, you know, he he, he really comes of age. In the Mexican-American War. Absolutely. Uh, and we talked about this in the last, po- last podcast with James K. Polk, who's president, and says, you know, we, we, we've annexed um, uh, the, the, the Texas area, and we want to, you know, push back the, the <laughs> Mexicans because they won't take our $20 million to buy the territory. So I'm sending troops down there. Zachary Taylor, you are going to lead them down there. And he yes, does. He does. And then what's interesting, I think we touched on this some in, in the James K. Polk podcast, is that when he gets there, he is so successful at driving the forces back, and then he doesn't um, listen well. He has some authority issues yes. with Polk, that Polk actually stalemates him and strips his troops down to, I think it was like 4,600 guys, yeah. and then has a different general go through and actually take Mexico City, refuses to yeah. Let. General Winfield Scott. Winfield takes, Scott. Yeah, he takes his soldiers away from Zachary and gives them to Winfield Scott. Yes. Says, "Go to Mexico City because he doesn't want Taylor riding in, right? Because he's afraid of the political uh, yeah. prowess this would give." Taylor's not a political man. In fact, one thing that I find fascinating about the life of Taylor is he never voted in his entire life for anything until he voted for himself in to be president. Yeah, because he said for him, military would came first. The, the politicians he, he didn't, didn't want to vote against a potential commander in chief. Yes, because for him, he said staying independent was the most important thing. Now, obviously. He'll, he'll run as a Whig, yeah. but he makes a statement, I'm not an ultra Whig, and I'm running for the sake of the country, and I'll never be controlled by a party. And, and he proved that. <laughs> he proved that. What was interesting is that when he did uh, cross the Rio Grande with his troops, and he did win at the Battle of Monterey, mm-hmm. um, he he then negotiated an eight-week armistice that's with the right. Mexicans. And Which that's kicks what, Polk off. Oh, yeah. And Polk comes back and says, I'm, I'm going to rescind that treaty. But, yes. But Again, that's the brilliance of Zachary Taylor. He knew he had vanquished them. He had beat them. Yes. And now it was a matter of letting them realize how bad it was going to get, and maybe now we can negotiate more. But no, Polk <laughs> wanted it all. But what's interesting is that so with what soldiers he has left over, Zachary Taylor goes over and wins the Battle of Buena Vista, yes. which opens the door. And defeats pretty much defeats Santa Ana yeah. for the most part. Yeah, and opens the door to Mexico City, yes. and he comes back a hero. Yes, which, and one of his top men um, during this time period is actually Ulysses S. Grant. Yes. Grant is one of his top officers, and Grant's, I wrote this quote down because I thought it was yeah. fascinating. Grant made this statement, speaking of Taylor, no soldier could face either danger or or responsibility more commonly than he, he was respected by all. Isn't that amazing? And they say, uh, Grant's biographer says that he kind of idolized Taylor, and it was actually uh, the the presidency of Taylor that Grant then will base his presidency off of. I believe that. I truly believe that. You know, it's interesting because it was, you know, back then they, they nominated not through a primary system, but through right. a convention system. Absolutely. And here you have, six weeks prior to the, uh, to the week convention, uh, he decides that he's going to run for president. He comes back as a hero in the Mexican War. He's had four decades of being in the military. In the meantime, the Democrats have have have, have chosen Lewis Cass, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and but but then there's that 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 anti-slavery abolitionist group, the Free Soil Party, the Free Soil Party yes. that puts up Martin Van Buren. Mm-hmm. Which today, if you were to th- that's a third party. So that's the third party yes. that dilutes the votes from Cass and allows 
for Zachary Taylor to get elected. Which is technically, if you're on the other side, this is a brilliant political strategy. I've had this conversation with my students before in class. Like, I don't know why we don't utilize this more in today's time, politically speaking. For example, if, if I was going to uh, run the Republican Party and I wanted the Republicans to win, why would you not run the most ultra-liberal, radical candidate you could in California, steal those 55 electoral votes over here to a radical third party, and then split your Democratic vote? Because they've done it to the Republican Party, I don't know how many times. If you can figure out a way to split political votes in a party, you ensure a victory, which is what happens here. When there's yeah. a third party that rises, Teddy Roosevelt does this when he runs the Blue Moose Party, right? When a third party rises, which could happen this time, too, an independent candidate. Oh, it could candidate, happen. It happened which with Ross split. Perot in 92. Yes. So it's actually, if you're on the other side, it's a brilliant political strategy. It happened in me. My first race for Congress, uh, there was the, the Democrats started this, quote, Florida Tea Party group <laughs> and recruited ultra right wing candidates to, run, to split your vote, to, to, to dilute my vote. Yes. I mean, I ended up winning, but not with the majority. I mm. got a, I got 48 percent of the vote, but 11 percent was taken by the Florida Tea Party, which was really and was proven to be sh- be started by wow. Democrats trying to dilute that. So that's what's happening with, with, with Zachary Taylor. Elevates him to president. And probably next to William Henry Harrison is the shortest-serving president yes. we have. Yes. And But, you know, I think what's fascinating about Zachary Taylor is that he was against the expansion of slavery. Yes. Yet he, he was a slaveholder. Slave. He fact, had two plantations. Yes. I read that he owned 300 slaves, yeah. which made him the second highest president, um, own, slave-owning president other behind Jefferson. Yeah. Jefferson owned, like, over 600, something crazy. And underneath Jefferson, he's actually the highest slave-owning president, yet he continues to, to tick off the South by not allowing slaves. Yeah, expansion. Exactly. And Especially fact, Southern Whigs. Yes. And the Southern Whigs are getting very upset now yes. because he doesn't want California to come in as a slave no. state. He, he he doesn't want to negotiate the great compromise or the compromise that of Clay 1850. That comes up with yes. it was just and, and the reason why is because they know that if this happens, then you're going to have a majority of abolitionists in Congress and that's mm. going to... But what's fascinating is that he... Zachary Taylor is so adamant, so strong, such a leader that he goes into Congress and he says, Southern states, if you succeed, I will personally lead the battle against you to keep you in the union, and I will hang you without, with less reluctance than I than hung my them. traitors in the Mexican American yes, War. Yes. yes, and here's the guy. Now he was born in Virginia. He's a slave owner, and he is determined to keep this union together. Yes, and he is willing to go against the Southern states. Yes, and he actually backs South Carolina because South Carolina, of course, is the first who does this. Which yep. ten years later, they'll be the first to succeed. Yes, but they actually come against him, and he backs them down right away, which makes you wonder: Had Taylor actually been able to stay in office, and you'd have the 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 bumbling presidency of Fillmore, which, I mean, we'll do that, yeah. <laughs> next week it's going to basically be like, hello, this is Miller Fillmore, we're leaving, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's going to be the shortest podcast we've yeah, ever yeah. done. But you wonder if Taylor stayed in office, if it could have delayed or completely Think about stopped that. the Civil War. Think about that. He was so strong in keeping the Union together. He had been through war. He Four had of been them. through <laughs> Yes. He knew how important, and he was a nationalist. Yes. He believed strong. in, very, to the extent that we were not going to split up the nation over slavery or anything else. We were going to keep it together, and we were going to work through this by way of our Constitution, because that's the beauty of, of, of our nation. And if he had lived, if he had lived longer than that 18 months or 16 mm. months that he was in office, what would have happened? Yes. You know, would he have been so strong, especially if he was a two-termer? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and negotiated slavery, the, you know, the, the abolition of slavery? Yes. Who knows? It, it took that moment in history for him to say, we're keeping the union together, to yes. really start the fuse, if you will, that led to the to the Civil War. Yeah, one interesting thing that you brought this up is, again, the Forgotten War, the Black Hawk War. Yeah. I love talking about this because the players in this war are amazing. So you have uh, Taylor, who is a colonel, who oversees what was called the Bad Axe Massacre. Yeah. So you have you have Taylor, who's here, who's overseeing it. And then his top officers are, you have Abraham Lincoln, mm, who I fights him that. as a captain. Wow. And you have Jefferson Davidson, the future oh, yeah, president, president of the Confederacy, yeah. who's also fighting under him. So he's able to keep Davis in line. So had he stayed president, would he have kept Davis from ever? In fact, Davis will marry his daughter. I know. Which and he it, hates at the time. In fact, he threatens to duel the guy. Yeah. He actually threatens to take him out on the field and basically shoot him for trying to marry his daughter. And they court in secret over this. So yeah. he and then had she this dies three months later, of I think. Of malaria, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, so he had this way of keeping these guys in check. So had he been able to stay in office for eight years, he could have maybe prevented Davis from ever. I mean, he's just, he took commander-in-chief very seriously. He did. And if he was a commander-in-chief, he was going to keep this nation together. But he was very calm. It wasn't the irate. You're right petulant child that we see so many times in modern politics. Amen. He did it in a very calm way, in a very civil way. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is he had zero political experience True. coming into the office. Now, 
we've had some other presidents that was not always a successful thing. What are your thoughts from somebody serving in Congress? Is it a good thing at times to have a president come in with zero political baggage and just from military career, from law career, whatever, step in the office and say, okay, from an outsider's perspective, we're going to do this a different way. Can that be beneficial? It depends on whether they acknowledge and understand the process itself. Because okay. the process has to be understood if you're trying to get something done through it. It can't be my way and no, or, and, and no other way. <laughs> and I think that's what we see these people are coming in as, uh, quote, non-politicians and say, we're going to do it this way. What they don't understand that this is a process that requires a give and take, mm. which unfortunately is the bad word called compromise. Yes. But it is the only way that we've been able to get things done is through a compromise. And if they're willing to stay true to their agenda, but yet do some give and take, because the other side always has to have something to take home. Otherwise, you're just that's a protracted uh, you know, uh, gridlock and you get nothing done. So I, I, I don't mind somebody coming in with no experience as long as they understand that the process requires a give and take. That's You're good. in charge of the process in that role. Right. And as long as you don't lose sight of that, knowing that the process says that you don't always get it your way. In it's fact, almost like a horse trading, right? It's like, it when you, it's like when you buy a car for the first time, your dad kind of teaches you how to haggle and both sides have to feel like they win. Like you don't want to get messed up on the deal and they don't want to get messed up on the deal. Um, and that's kind of Absolutely. the idea of, of politics in a nutshell, right? Yeah. From, from, the, from a simple mindset, it's the idea of it's horse trading. Can we both walk away from here feeling like we won? Which means that's sometimes we have to give something process. away. That's the process. Yes. Look at a marriage. Who gets their way the whole time? Good. Yeah, not a very successful marriage and <laughs> no. not a very long-lasting marriage. Absolutely. You know, there's got to be a give and take, but there has to be a focus on the greater good. That's good. And I think that's where Zachary Taylor realized that despite the fact that he was a slaveholder, despite the fact that he was a military man who went through a lot of war and probably saw a lot of massacres mm. and knew that the greater good was to make sure we don't have these things continue in our nation. That's good. And that's where I think he was transitional. If he had been there longer... You know, we might not have had the Civil War, probably so, unless he was a two-termer that could negotiate, you know, uh, the, the abolition of Possibly slavery. Possibly could have. One of the things I, I ran into that I thought was rather fascinating was, you know, he was not necessarily the most confident man about his future. <laughs> and in fact, I, I, I ran into a quote that he gave to his brother in a letter that he wrote while he was in the Second Seminole War Down in that Florida. place they call Okeechobee. The Battle of Okeechobee. Yep, where yes. you're familiar. Yes. And, and he, he, he says, look... He writes his brother and he says, I can assure you that my days or dreams of ambition, if they ever existed, are past. Mm -hmm. Both age and incl inclination admonish me to sign for ease, quiet and retirement on a snug little farm of <laughs> 100 or two acres and a healthy climate. That was written in 1838. <laughs> He had pretty much given up. He had yes. spent 30 years in the military. Yes. He doesn't really see any future for him. You know, everything he tries, nothing seems to be work out. Please, people that are listening to this, understand that the people that become these leaders are no different from anybody else. They're Absolutely. average. They are given above average opportunities that makes them have the chance to do extraordinary things, but they don't give up. They feel defeated. They feel deflated, but they stay the course. He stayed the course and 10 years later becomes president of the United States. I like that. I always tell my students this, give yourself the chance to fail. Absolutely. You're going to try things that you're going to be absolutely horrible at. Most of these historical figures were horrible at things. However, they had a spirit of drive that mm -hmm. they would not give. I love one of the stories about Taylor when he was young. It says at the age of 17 that he jumped into the Ohio River and swam from one side to the other in the dead of winter. And they asked him later why he did. And he said he wanted to see if his body could take it. That's amazing. And I like that. It's the idea of drive. Was he the smartest? No. no. Was he the most eloquent? No. no. Was he the most athletic? No, he was 5'8". They said he was 5'8 with short legs and long arms, which I get that. I'm built like an orangutan. My arms are longer than my legs. So I understand that build, right, very, very well. I wear like a size 37 sleeve, and I wear like a 28 pants cuff. So I get this idea of being built like an orangutan. It's an Irish thing, I guess. So he doesn't have like all of the, the good things going through no. that the world says, okay, that's the that's the quarterback. That's the captain of the debate team. That's the big stuff. Oh, yeah. He's I'll average. never amount to anything. Look at me. Yeah. He wasn't you know, voted most likely to succeed. No, he was not, if they had ever had that election. And in fact, <laughs> and again, he becomes president because of a third party. And and and, Absolutely. and and he doesn't even set his sights on being president until six weeks before the convention where they nominate yes. for the Whig Party. And, and, and he steps into the role, and he does it very well, but he does it as a commander-in-chief more Good. so than as a diplomat. And, and he has some scandal with the, with his cabinet, <laughs> um, and and the military more who succeeds him eventually, you know, gets rid of that cabinet. But what happened domestically 
was amazing in the sense that he allowed for, he fought for, he made sure that California came in as a non-slave state. Mm. And, you know, they, they, he, he let them write their own constitutions and bypass the territorial process yes. so that they could be accepted as states. That absolutely upset the Southerners. But he was determined to make sure that happened because he did not want to see our country perpetuate itself as a slave nation. And he knew absolutely. that if we could get start getting rid of it in the expansion, that ultimately we could get rid of it all. Yeah. And one of the things you, you touched on, the like, is he was so pro-union, he was nationalist. And I think in, in today's time, the word nationalism is, is just, it's almost a bad word. It's not a bad thing to be patriotic. No. It's not a bad thing to love your country. I realize that in the 20th century, nationalism was, was identified with, you know, kind of Hitler and Mussolini. Right. And this idea of nationalism became known as fascism. But that's not the true sense of the word nationalism. The idea of loving your country and wanting what's good for your country is not a bad thing. No. I, I would love to see a president stand up and be like, we love America and we want to take care of America. Right? And, and we don't see that a, a whole lot. No, we don't. And, and unfortunately, you know, when you look back at these presidents that we had, I just can't help but thinking that, you know, they they, they went through a lot of yes. trials and tribulations, yes. especially if you were in the military back then. Imagine Ooh. being in the military back then. Yeah. But look at like you talked about, you know, Ulysses Grant, who said that the mm -hmm. Mexican-American War was one of the, the mo Biggest wasted, bungles. Yeah, that we've ever had. You know, he learns from that. I mean, yes. again, it's it's providence. It's God's way of saying you're here to yes. do this, and because of you doing this, we will see this happen in others. Mm. And and the magnitude of what will happen because of your them witnessing you doing this for the greater good is only going to help our nation. I like that. And we have to continue to see that. We have to continue to engage people in this process because they could be those agents of change for good yes. that learn from others, even others who have done bad things. Yes. It reminds me of the words of Jesus that he who endures to the end will be saved. That idea yeah. of staying in there, which reminds me back to the Battle of Okeechobee, because you know we got to talk about Okeechobee for a minute. <laughs> and in the Battle of Okeechobee, actually, he, he confronts eight, he's got 800 troops with him. He's going to confront 480 Seminole Indians yeah. at the north shore of, of the Lake Okeechobee. And as, as, which I've seen these battlefields, as he's riding in, um, he, he makes a very different military tactical. He doesn't decide to flank or to pincer maneuver. He does a frontal assault. Really? Just leads everything straight frontal assault. The problem is the Seminole Indians knew that he was coming. So they had cut down the marshy grass. That way it wouldn't slow down their arrows. Because Taylor's thinking that arrows can't really go. I mean, you, you both right. hunt. You understand right. this, right? I mean, you can right. barely catch a leaf that thing's off. Right. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, it, you, it, you get this. Yes, I so, did many limbs. <laughs> yeah, you, you're a champion limb hunter, right? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> we've all done that. So he understands this, right? So they've cut down this grass, and now his frontal assault is being taken down. But what made Taylor so unique is he would not relent. He sent him four different waves, which, I mean, if you're the grunt, you hate him for this, right? Oh, yeah. But he sends in four waves, and he eventually takes this land despite the fact of having bad odds and bad military tacticians. But he sits upon his horse, which was called Old Whitey, mm -hmm. which I felt this guy, no one, it's Okeechobee, right? Like I have family <laughs> that that's what they would name their horse, trust me. And he's sending in troop after troop, wave after wave, just watching them fall, never even moves. It said that at one point he actually had a button shot off his jacket and he never even flinches Isn't until finally he takes the land and then the Seminole Indians are driven further south down in the Big Cypress area, which You're is right. where they still are today. And again, I have the utmost respect uh, for, for the, the Seminole, Seminole Indians. Absolutely. The only Native people who did not sign a peace treaty, You're who right. continued to fight, drive beyond drive, really impressive people group. But the Battle of Okeechobee kind of settled that land, which of course my family very shortly thereafter went into Okeechobee and have been there for for generations, but wow. um, fascinating guy. And the one thing you taught us is determination. Like he did not waver when he made his mind up. He yeah. did it. He did, and he saw it through the end. Yeah, and you know, I, I I tried to find out whether he was a religious man or not. And the one thing I found, which was fascinating, is that uh, when he was supposed to be sworn into office, he was supposed to uh, the uh, James K. Polk's last day was March fourth. 1849. At that point, he is supposed to be sworn into office. However, it's on a Sunday. Yes. And Zachary Taylor says, I am not going to take the oath of office on the That's Lord's right. Day. That's right. So he waits until March 5th. Mm -hmm. And then there's this there's this constitutional discussion about whether the Speaker of the House, well, actually, the Speaker of the House was out of office on March 3rd, mm -hmm. so he couldn't have been there. Uh, but but it's fascinating to think that for a day, at least, we went without a president. Yeah. And survived. Yeah, exactly. And, Imagine but, that. <laughs> yes. But, but he, you know, he, he, he was known to be an Episcopalian. Yes. But one of the things I found fascinating also was that he... Um, uh, he didn't do a national day of prayer hmm. and fasting. Uh, in fact, he said in a letter dated November 5th, 1849, while writing, 
while uniting cordially in the universal feeling of thankfulness to God for his manifold blessings, and especially for the abatement of the pestilence which so lately walked in our midst, I have yet thought it most proper to leave the subject of a thanksgiving proclamation where custom in many parts of this country has so long consigned it in the hands of the governors of the several states. <laughs> so here's a guy who's states a nationalist, rights. exactly, who say, and who takes the issue of, of you know of, of, of state religion and says, you know what? It's up to the states. Hmm. I'm not going to say give a national proclamation of a day of prayer. Interesting. I'm going to allow the states. So what does that tell you? Does it tell you that he was he was he wasn't religious, or does he does it tell you that even though you know, he was a nationalist, he firmly believed in states' so rights? So I searched and scoured archives for this as well, looking for letters. I finally found a quote that I think you're going to like that I think settles this because it's hard to find. Like he it doesn't is say hard a lot, to find, but it wasn't found, there very long. I found this quote by him, and I thought this, you, you'll like this. This is what he said. The Bible is the best of books, and I wish that it were in the hands of everyone. It is indispensable to the safety and preservance of our institutions. A free government cannot exist without religion and morals, and there cannot be morals without religion. Especially the Bible should be placed in the hands of the young. It is the best school book in the world. I would wish that all people were brought up on this one holy book. Amazing, Caleb. And that was 100 and some, what, 70 years ago. Yes. He says that. 170 years yes. ago. Yes. A man who saw so much atrocity, Absolutely. who never gave up, no. who found himself in despair, and yet becomes the 12th president of the United States. Yes. Absolutely fascinating. And the, stands you, up and says, the Bible, that yeah. is what we got to base our country on. Because we can't, remember what all the founding fathers said was Jefferson or Madison or Monroe, that this republic will not work unless we have a virtuous people. and moral people. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. Like if we have a representative government that's supposed to represent the, the, the people, if the people become unruly, if the people become unethical, then you're going to have an unethical government. Absolutely. You cannot legislate against that. No. You, you can't legislate morality. When you look in Congress you have it in your heart. and you see the, the junk that's there, that's just representative of the society. Absolutely. We, we throw stones and we go, look at Congress, look at Congress. Well, look at society. Exactly. Congress is dysfunctional. Look at the rest of the it's country. It's a microcosm. Yeah, absolutely. Of the rest of the country. Yeah. So if the country gets healthy, which I believe happens through the church, right, through the gospel Absolutely. of Jesus, as the country gets healthy, then maybe Congress could get healthy. It starts in the communities. Yes. Fully agree. You know, we have to be the change we want to see. Yes. And so, even if you become a Zachary Taylor, it's okay. <laughs> That's right. You know, That's we right. could probably use another Zachary Taylor. That's right. I love when I was reading through his... Um, <laughs> His troops, they talked about the fact that uh, when his portrait, he's always in uniform, right? Yes, like, he is. Like the Class A uniform, you know, showing everything off. But they said that actually when he fought, he thought that was too restrictive. And typically, he fought in jeans, like a button-up with just like his ribbon showing his rank, and a straw hat with his forty-five on his head. Wow. That was typically how he fought in the Mexican-American War. Wow. Um, like a George Patton. Yeah, exactly. Just like a Patton. That's what made wow. me think of as well. So his death is another time. This We, we talked about this with Polk as well. In this time period, doctors killed you. <laughs> faster than almost anything else. And I always tell my, my wife, I, I wonder if 50 years from now, when we look back at our medical research, if we won't say the same thing. Yeah. But July 4th, uh, there is a, 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 a celebration. Uh, they're celebrating the, the, the Washington Monument. It's almost complete. Yeah. He's been outside for like two and a half hours in the dead heat, comes back to the White House, and his favorite snack was milk Mm-hmm. And cherries. Yeah, fruit. Oh. oh, I can't imagine from Florida heat being outside for hours sweating mm. and be like, "Give me a glass of milk." And this is July Fourth in Washington and D.C. And cherries. I've been there many times on that day, and it is incredibly <laughs> hot and humid, and yeah. it is nasty. Yes, and and dairy's obviously unpasteurized at this point, oh, which yeah. we can argue whether or not that's that's There's good. No that's ice, a, right? But it's not <laughs> ice. And D.C. was a very dirty town at this time period. Yeah. It kind of still is. Um, <laughs> but they begin to take this this raw milk and these unwashed cherries. And he eats and he gets a serious gastrointestinal issue. So he's got gastritis, basically. And the doctors bleed him, give him opioids, and then give him laxatives. Yeah. And Ooh. he's dead in five days. Yeah. All right. Well, imagine that. I mean, like, can you imagine having gastrointestinal illness and then your doctor gives you more laxatives and bleeds you out? No. So he's, he's dead in five days. Yeah. In all reality, most medical historians, because, you know, medical history is its own subfield, most medical historians say had they left him alone, he might have recovered. The doctors probably killed him. Just think if he had. Yeah. Imagine you know, we'll have the— All those what-ifs. Yes. Yes. So upon his death, his wife is, um, is, a, da- is, a, is a, a very religious woman, very devout. Right. She's also an Episcopal. Um, and she refuses to allow his body to be embalmed. 
She doesn't want I his body to be embalmed. Oh. So he is laid in state, and then he's put in a wagon, and he's carried down the streets for burial. Um, his his old war horse is still alive, who is named Old Whitey. Wow. And Old Whitey goes in front of the carriage um, as the last show of honor for him because it was said that Old Whitey, he loved his horse so much that this is before the Secret Service, this is before Gates, wow. that Old Whitey would walk around the White House lawn and graze on grass. So old Whitey, they take him from the White House lawn, and he actually walks in front of the, the casket, showing that last respect for Taylor. And then Abraham Lincoln, upon his death, because he served within the Black Hawk War. Right. He was a captain under uh, Taylor, who's a colonel. So uh, uh, Taylor's a colonel. Lincoln is a captain serving underneath him. And, and then Lincoln said this upon his death. And I think this is such an amazing statement. It did not happen to General Taylor once in his life to fight a battle on equal terms or on terms advantageous to himself, and yet he was never beaten. Mm. And he never retreated. General Taylor's battles were not distinguished for brilliant military maneuvers, but in all he seems rather to have conquered by the exercise of a sober and steady judgment, coupled with a dogged incapacity to understand that defeat was possible. Wow. Wow. The final words that Lincoln would say about Taylor. The, that's that's uh, that's impactful. It is. It's not because of his brilliance. No. It's and not. he understood the consequences. Yes. He knew that defeat was a real possibility. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me so of... So be it. Yeah, exactly. It kind of reminds me of, of, of King Solomon. And, and, and King Solomon in the Old Testament, he was this, this super successful king. If you've read the Bible, uh, our listeners, you understand that he was, he was the most prosperous king that there's ever been. The Bible says he had more right. money, more wealth, more wisdom than any other king before him. He was the son of King David. The legend says, the Jewish legend says, that when he's sitting before his, his wealth and, and, and all this money and all this, this prestige, and he had a thousand women around him and all the stuff that he oh, has... Yeah. He looked over at one of his advisors, this was Jewish legend, and he said, I need something to keep me from getting too proud. And it said that the Jewish advisors made him a ring. And in Hebrew, it said, this too shall pass. Mm. And he wore that at all times to remind him that it was all fleeting. How true that is. How true that is. You know, you let your ego control you and who remembers you 50 years from now, let yes. alone 10 years from now? <laughs> yes. You know? But we're still talking about Taylor, who was an average... Yeah. Man in every way. Yeah. And his son, his only son, ends up serving in the Confederate Army. Yes. Isn't it amazing? Even though his father was doggedly against, against a confederacy and believed wholeheartedly in pro-union. Yeah. And his right-hand man's Abraham Lincoln. Yes. <laughs> and Ulysses S. Grant. And again, the influence he had on those people. Yes. Is about, you know, had he not been there, would we have had an Abraham Lincoln? Mm. Would we have had a Ulysses S. Grant? That's a brilliant thought. And, 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 and I just, I wonder... You know, of course, Abraham Lincoln was by far one of the most brilliant presidents, oh, if not the most fully brilliant agreed. president we've ever had. Fully agreed. But uh, you, you, again, self-taught. We'll talk about him. In a, yes. Oh, I'm looking forward to that one. We so. got to get through Millard Fillmore yes. to get to him, right? No, but I like what you said. His legacy continued. It reminds me uh, of, of the scripture passage that talks about the saints. And it says, when they died, their works do follow them. Good passage. And I like that. Yes. And I think with Taylor, his works did follow him. Yes. So this has been the life of Zachary Taylor. Thank you for listening today. Thank you.